Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kristen, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for South Florida Wildlife Center. So for those of you that have never heard of our center before, we are a wildlife hospital in Fort Lauderdale, and our mission is to rescue and rehabilitate sick and injured wildlife so we can release them back out into the wild, as well as educate the community about peaceful coexistence with our wild neighbors. So once a month, we host a wild lecture series so we can invite speakers that are doing amazing nature and conservation related related work um, all over to educate the community a little bit more about the work that they are doing. So we're really excited for our speaker today. Um, with us, we have Dr. Michael Heithouse, and he is a shark biologist, an explorer, an educator, as well as the executive dean at Florida International University. And he is going to be talking to us today all about his adventures in marine biology. So I'm going to toss it over to him so he can take over. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. So make sure you guys remember them or you can throw them in the chat as he's talking and we can always come to them at the end too. So I am going to toss it over to you, Dr. Heithouse. Go ahead. Great. Well, thank you so much. And, and thanks to everybody for uh, Showing up this afternoon, uh, I am always excited to talk about uh, oceans, ocean animals, and uh, and exploration. And yeah, you know, today I just thought I'd share a, you know, a few of the things that we do that uh, I think are kind of exciting. And yeah, you know, a lot of these stories are really relevant to the South Florida community here. And even though we go go all over the world for a lot of the projects we do. Um, a lot of the information we're getting really is helpful for managing even South Florida ecosystems. Um, I am a marine biologist, um, and uh, yeah, here at Florida International University, I'm actually down at our Biscayne Bay campus where I have a uh, lab full of PhD students, and we've got faculty working uh, pretty much uh, all over the world. And a lot of the focus that we have is really on trying to figure out how we can have awesome, healthy ocean ecosystems, um, but also that provide the uh, resources and opportunities that people need as well. Um, you know, one of my other particular interests beyond just the science is sharing it with the public. And so I've also had the opportunity to work with Discovery Channel and National Geographic, especially uh, to bring some of the excitement of scientific research and the importance of these animals we're working on uh, to the broader public. My personal work has been focused for years on top predators. Um, and in the oceans, a lot of the times we're talking about sharks, like this bull shark, but that also includes animals like uh, bottlenose dolphins, spotted dolphins, uh, big whales, and you know, some of the you know kind of large bodied but you know medium level predators uh, like sea turtles. And really, what we want to know in our lab is how important is it to have healthy populations of these animals and ecosystems and what will happen to the oceans um, if we don't have them. And, and this is really an issue because when we look around the world, um, it would help if I actually started this as a slideshow probably, um, you know, when we look around the world, we see that in some cases, uh, populations of these big animals may have decreased 90% or more. And, uh, you know, you can see why that might happen when you think that, you know, an individual bluefin tuna can sell for more than a million dollars. And so there's lots of pressure on these populations. And, you know, we want to make sure that uh, we maintain them. And, you know, one, anybody, be, it's a little hard on Zoom to get the, uh, audience responses. Uh, but, you know, you may have seen uh, years ago, and I think it's still on the show, Deadliest Catch, which is about these uh, fishers catching crabs in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. And um, yeah, that's where this video I'm going to show you is taken by a friend of mine who is on one of these boats in the middle of nowhere, Alaska. Um, and this stellar sea lion decided it was a whole lot easier to visit the buffet table uh, than it was to uh, work for a meal. You know, that one looks a little too big. So maybe just spit that one out and grab another one. But, you know, they, this video kind of shows that potential conflict between people and animals. And so uh, in this case, the fisherman had a pretty good sense of humor about the situation. But what we need to do is figure out, you know, how do we still have healthy fisheries, but healthy ecosystems um, as well? And 
you know, this is especially true for sharks. Um, and, you know, shark populations, they are one of the groups when we look around the world, we estimate that probably more than 100 million sharks are removed from the oceans every year. And these are animals that grow slowly. Uh, they may take more than a decade to reach maturity. They only have a few pups every couple of years. So yeah, that many sharks being removed from oceans really isn't sustainable long-term. So we have to figure out how to protect and even rebuild shark populations um, around the world. In marine mammals, we've had the same thing. You know, the big whales uh, have really uh, collapsed due to whaling. And, you know, even with long-term protections in some cases, their populations aren't rebounding as quickly as we'd like to. And to be able to protect these animals, we have to learn a whole lot about them. And that can be really hard when you've got sharks that can swim across entire ocean basins or animals like sperm whales that may be able to dive down, you know, uh, more than a mile deep, hold their breath for an hour and a half or more. You know, how do you get information on what they're doing? And for that, we have to turn to technology a lot. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite things that we do is create these camera systems that we can put on animals. So we can go where the animals go. We can see what they see um, and really get their perspective on the world. And I can tell you, you really never know what you're going to get when the animal is running the camera. And, uh, you yeah, so probably some of you have dogs and, you know, maybe seen your dog meet another dog in the park, or you've seen that happen. And, you know, does it look anything like this green turtle meeting another turtle? And I can tell you, people have been studying turtles in some areas for years, and they didn't know that sometimes they would meet each other the same way the dogs in the park do with a sniff of the backside. So, you know, you get kind of these funny, you know, really quick insights into their world. But by getting these cameras on animals in lots of situations, we find out a lot more about what their needs are. Um, for example, this is a green turtle in uh, Western Australia. One thing that we found by putting these cameras on them is that they spend a lot of their time cleaning themselves by rubbing their bodies on rocks and corals. Um, and they'll even get into fights over uh, their favorite spot to rub. I mean, this is a, a turtle saying, please go away. And, uh, you know, they'll they'll spend a lot of time cleaning themselves. And yeah, they've got more social interactions. We think they sometimes will get into these staring contests that may may last a half hour. And then one turtle freaks out and swims away. And we just don't know why that was. And so, you know, when we put these cameras on, we also get lots of new uh, new questions coming up. Yeah, here's another crazy thing we saw with turtles. I mean, greet another turtle by just headbutting? Just, you crazy stuff we see all the time. Now, uh, for each animal we work with, we have to figure out exactly how we're going to put the cameras on uh, to have the least uh, effect on them possible. You know, sometimes when we're working with sharks, we can put the camera on them right away. Uh, but, you know, for some animals like hammerhead sharks, they can be very fragile, so we don't want to catch them. So in this situation, we uh, simply got a camera and uh, went underwater and put it on by hand. And uh, you can see that's uh, yeah, not necessarily as easy as you would think, um, but through the uh, wonders of video editing, you get it on the first try. But believe me, this took a lot longer than, than that. But you know, then we can kind of see what these animals are doing. And you know, I have to admit, you know, we thought we were gonna, when we first started doing this with sharks, we thought we we're gonna see lots of exciting behavior and sharks feeding. You know, and it turns out most of the time sharks' lives are pretty boring and, uh, you know, they channel their inner dory. They just keep swimming. Um, but, you know, still, when we are able to see what habitats they're using, how they're interacting with other animals, we're getting really important information that helps us figure out how to design uh, conservation protections. Um, another species that uh, I've had the opportunity to work with are, are humpback whales in southeast Alaska. Yeah, and these are a really interesting uh, animal because in Southeast Alaska, you know, these whales actually form really long-term social bonds. And so they may go to Hawaii every winter, but in the summer they come back to Alaska and they find the same group of friends a lot of times. And they basically work together to catch these small fish. And that's pretty hard to do when those fish are so fast. So what they do is they blow these big bubble nets the bubbles come up to the surface, 
They can trap the schools of fish in the bubbles and the fish are afraid to go across the bubbles and the whales can come up and just scoop them up. But usually what we saw was just what you see here, uh, fish at the surface and then whale mouths everywhere. So we were you know, putting camera systems on to try to figure out how the whales are kind of putting together the choreography of this underwater and also how to, um, yeah, that didn't work so well, did it? Neither did that one. But eventually we got it sorted out and uh, we were able to get these cameras on the whales. And um, then we can get a look inside what's going on. I, hopefully you can hear the sound on this. Um, but what we see here, it's kind of murky water, but you see the school of fish up there. The whales are kind of screaming at their prey. They flash the undersides, of their white flippers at the prey. And by working together, they're able to pack that school really, really tightly um, up to the surface and then capture them there uh, very easily. But you know, one of the things we see here is if you've got animals that are relying on having the same individuals there all the time, you know, you, losing certain individuals from that population might cause problems for them being able to feed in this way. Um, and it also just shows that you know, these herring populations are just absolutely critical uh, to these whales. Um, another species we've started working on of the whales recently are uh, the sperm whales. And in the Caribbean, even though they've been protected for a long time, a lot of these populations aren't looking like they are uh, increasing the way we'd like to. And uh, a lot of these whales that are uh, washing up on beach is dead now. You're seeing lots of plastics in their stomachs. And so one of the things we wanted to do is to try to get insights into how they're feeding, what are they feeding on, and you know why might they not be uh, reproducing as quickly as we would be hoping. And so what we've really done is just the first attempts to put these camera systems on these whales. And um, you know this is you can see a mother sperm whale and a younger sperm whale that's come over there. If you can hear that clicking sound, that's called a coda. And uh, the sperm whales all have their own uh, kind of coda in their social group. So you can hear click, 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 click. And you hear the mom make it and then the, the calf. And that's also part of the echolocation that they can use to find uh, what they feed on way down deep. And for these sperm whales, that may even include uh, giant squid. And, uh, you know, so what we've been trying to do now is create new camera systems with really low light capabilities so we don't have to put headlights on the cameras and we can see how they're feeding uh, way down underwater. Because so far what we've gotten is a lot of dark and then clouds of ink going by the camera light um, and then maybe a little bit of a tentacle uh, inside the mouth of the whale. But we haven't been able to really get the data, you know, video on the, the feeding we'd like. Another innovation we're working on right now, um, and this is uh, Dr. Beth Whitman here at FIU, we're working on uh, creating 360 cameras uh, that we can put on animals. So this is the first ever, as far as we know, uh, 360 camera that was ever put on a sea turtle. And so this lets us not just see right in front of the animal, but it lets us see all around. If you were having some of those virtual reality goggles on, you can see what the animal's reacting to all around it. And the other fun thing that we're uh, working towards eventually when we have some free time is actually using these videos where people can kind of be on the back of an animal and see all around. We're going to try to use this to create uh, new lessons for kids in schools to kind of help learn how to collect data, um, but also just kind of be inspired by riding on the back of a sea turtle or a, a shark and when we finally get those systems uh, set up. Now, for all those marine cameras you saw, uh, to get the information and the video back from them, we have to uh, get the cameras back. They're designed to release from the animals. They float to the surface, and then we can go pick them up. Um, when I was working at National Geographic years ago, we also started to make these systems to work on uh, land animals. And one of the first animals we worked with uh, was lions. And you know, you might think, hey, I've seen that on TV. You don't need uh, cameras on lines. You can just sit back with uh, binoculars on those great savannas. But it actually turns out that savanna habitat's a very small part of uh, the African landscape. And most of it's dense bushland, where if you're crashing behind these uh, lines, trying to watch them in a GP, you have some very annoyed lions because you'd be scaring away any potential prey for miles around. 
And so uh, the engineers developed these systems and um, we were then, you know, how's the lion going to react to it? But, you know, the lion that wore the camera and she was part of a long term uh, health monitoring program. So when they did the health check, we put the camera on. She ignored it completely and so did her cubs. And then we wondered what would happen when we released that uh, camera system. And so those animals were uh, just kind of lying around and we sent the signal to the camera to release and there was a little click. Layla the lioness did not respond at all, but the cubs' ears pricked up and they looked over and uh, they figured that they had found the world's greatest chew toy. And they drug this camera through the bush for hours and they chewed on it. The engineer who built the camera was sitting next to me asking me to go get it back from the lions. Those are wild lions. You do not go take the camera from them. But eventually they got bored, left the camera alone, and we were able to get it back and it, it still worked again. Um, and so, you know, this is another area where we're always kind of pushing the envelope for trying to create new systems. Now, the information we get from these camera systems is all, all well and good. But, you know, really one of the things that we want to do is try to understand how whole ecosystems are working, um, especially if we want to try to restore places like South Florida to what they might have looked like before uh, people got involved. So one of the places that I've been going for, I don't want to tell you how long because that would date me, but OK, more than 20 years um, is a place called Shark Bay in Western Australia. And it's pretty much as far away as you can get from Fort Lauderdale uh, and still be on dry land. But the reason that we've been going there is because Shark Bay gives us a view of what the oceans probably used to look like. Um, it has some of the world's largest seagrass beds. Um, yeah, the largest probably are right here on the West Florida shelf. But, you know, uh, Shark Bay is a, probably a close second. Um, and I originally went to Shark Bay uh, to study dolphins, and I was really interested in their behavior and how they managed to get enough food. How did they navigate this seagrass ecosystem? Um, and when I went down there, we went out, we, we looked at all these dolphins, we saw where they were spending their time and found that they weren't spending as much time in the areas that we thought they might be where all the food was. And then we started to notice this. And that is that a huge number of these uh, dolphins had bites from sharks on them. And in fact, about 75% of the dolphins in Shark Bay have bites on them from tiger sharks. Now, I don't know if he is the uh, luckiest or most unlucky dolphin in Shark Bay, but you know, we had, there was one dolphin when I did this project at the time that had been attacked probably nine different times uh, by a shark. But he was still out there, so he got away each time. And so, you know, that kind of got me interested in, you know, tiger sharks and, and how are they influencing uh, these dolphins? And, you know, back when I started this project, I thought, you know, we must know plenty about tiger sharks, so I don't have to do anything. But it turned out we knew almost nothing about them. You know, some scientists had started to do some work in Hawaii but um, we really didn't know a lot about these animals. And so uh, that meant that, uh, that we had to study them. And now tiger sharks are, they're kind of officially awesome animals. Um, they can get to be 15 to 18 feet long and they're really built for taking big prey. They have very wide heads. Uh, their snout is right at the end of uh, their body. And so they can kind of reach out and grab on to uh, really big prey. The other thing they have are these really special teeth. You know, most sharks have triangular or very pointy teeth. They're meant for either cutting or kind of like, you know, slicing through or grabbing on and holding on to slippery prey. But tiger sharks have these curved teeth with serrations on them. So they can even grab on to a sea turtle, shake their head back and forth and cut straight through a turtle shell. Um, and, you know, that means that they can eat pretty much anything. Sea cows, sea turtles, it's all on the menu for tiger sharks. Now, if you are a tiger shark and you have eaten a sea turtle, you have a problem. You have all that yummy turtle meat in your stomach, but you also have turtle shell. But uh, tiger sharks have this all sorted. They can leave it in their stomach until uh, they've digested all of the good bits. And then they can just kind of turn their stomach inside out through their mouth get rid of the shell, slurp their stomach back down, and they're ready to go again. So just incredible animals. 
Um, so in Shark Bay, you know, what's on the menu for tiger sharks besides the dolphins? Uh, one thing that they they like to eat is dugongs. This is Australia's version of a manatee. Uh, they're a little bit smaller than manatees, and uh, hopefully, I don't. Hopefully, it's not hidden behind the uh, Muppet boxes of uh, Zoom people. But they also have a tail that looks a lot more like a whale or a dolphin tail than it does a manatee tail. Um, the dugongs, even though we call them sea cows like the manatees, we should probably be calling them sea pigs because instead of kind of biting the leaves of seagrass, they'd actually rather kind of dig down into the sediment um, and eat the stems of the seagrass called rhizomes because those for a lot of the seagrasses are more nutritious. So when they feed in that way, they kind of send big plumes of mud out um, and create a, a mess of the seagrass. So here, here are the dugongs. You can see them going through these seagrass beds um, and you can kind of see that tail right there. Um, the other thing that the uh, tiger sharks love to eat in Shark Bay um, that also eats seagrass is the green sea turtle. Um, same species that we have here in, um, in Florida. And uh, you know, these animals like to eat the, uh, the seagrass. Although in Australia, when we put those cameras on them, we found that they also like to eat a lot of jellyfish and comb jelly. So it looks like some of the turtles will eat a lot of seagrass. But other ones will spend a lot of time just swimming through the water column, you know, eating jellyfish, 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 comb jelly. I don't know. Maybe it stings a little and is like spicy food, but uh, some of these turtles just love them. So what I thought I'd do real quick is just show you this video of Shark Bay just to see a little bit more of all the amazing things that are out there. Um, and I don't know if anyone can throw it in the chat if you are hearing the video or the audio or not. You know, I can't think of anywhere else in the world like Shark Bay. They have such a big, vibrant, relatively untouched seagrass ecosystem. It's pretty much unheard of. It has one of the most amazing assemblages of animals on the planet. But there's one species that's particularly critical here. The presence of tiger sharks changes the dynamics of the bay. Oh, look, at that's a beefy, beefy shark. You know, you know, Our work with tiger sharks focuses on when they're here, how many are here, and which habitats they prefer. Okay, go ahead, Mike. So believe it or not, this is kind of like medium large shark in Shark Bay. Our average size of sharks there is more than uh, 10 feet long. With this information, we can predict what might happen in other places where sharks are disappearing. It turns out to learn about tiger sharks, you have to spend about 95. Okay, yes. I. Um, so you can see it's an amazing place. And you know, the thing that, uh, we don't want to watch the video the whole time, but the, the thing about our work in Shark Bay is that even though we're trying to understand how important tiger sharks are th there and what would happen if we lose those tiger sharks, we actually spent probably 95% of our time studying the prey of tiger sharks as well as the uh, the seagrass itself. So to study predators, it's not all the fun stuff that you see on TV. It's also a lot of the work on the other, other pieces. So what have we found after 20 years of studying tiger sharks, their prey and seagrasses um, in Shark Bay? Well, one of the things we found is that those tiger sharks are probably critical to the health of the seagrasses. So what we see in the bay is that when there are no tiger sharks around, the dugongs are sea pigs. They dig down, they you know, tear up the seagrass. Um, but then when the tiger sharks are there, they stop, or sorry, they stop being the uh, the sea pigs and they become sea cows again. So they daintily bite the the leaves of the seagrass instead of really digging down. And the reason for this, is probably that you know you don't want to create this giant plume of mud all around you where you can't see anything, but the sharks know exactly where you are. So you know you don't want to kind of like turn out the lights and close your eyes uh, if there might be something dangerous around. And it turns out that some years tiger sharks are present all year round, and when they aren't there, it's not for very long. So most of the time, the dugongs really have to feed in a way that isn't as damaging to the seagrass. The other thing that we see is that in times when the sharks are around, 
the dugongs don't spend a lot of time in those really super lush seagrass areas. They actually spend their time way out along the edges of these shallow banks where it's a lot safer. And so what that means is that the seagrass in the middle of these banks can grow up to not just be sea grasses, but really kind of sea bushes. And you can see it's this incredible habitat. And that's really important because it's that seagrass that's the spot where the fish can grow up to be the bigger fish that we like to catch or the shrimp and crabs can live there when they're smaller and then they get bigger and are the things we eat as well. So we might think, you know, people that are fishing don't want a lot of sharks around, but it turns out if you like catching those fish and the eating the crabs, you probably do want the, the tiger sharks around. The other thing is that when you have this really super dense seagrass like this, that creates a lot of dead seagrass and the dead seagrass gets buried. And so that kind of actually pulls carbon and carbon dioxide out of the water. So these may be really important areas, even from a climate perspective, um, for what we call blue carbon or ways where you can get kind of carbon out of the atmosphere and buried. And so the sharks protecting the seagrass means that even sharks might be an important part of this, uh, this system. Because what you see in areas where those tiger sharks don't spend a lot of time, where the dugongs and sea turtles can spend all their time feeding, it looks like this. It's just a really uh, well mowed lawn, lots of sand, not a lot of seagrass, and that doesn't bury a lot of carbon. And there's also nowhere to hide if you're a little shrimp, a crab, or a fish. So it doesn't provide the same uh, habitat value. Now, uh, the one last thing I want to say about Shark Bay before I tell some more stories is, uh, you know, this is more for a lot of the kids in the audience. You know, we talk a lot about all the amazing things we've done. What we don't often talk about is the things that worked very poorly at best. And, uh, you know, when I first started working in, in Shark Bay, um, I thought I was going to spend a lot of time underwater counting the fish populations to see where the... Uh, the dolphins were spending time relative to the fish. So I made this amazing shark cage to keep myself safe. Um, and yeah, I learned how to fiberglass so I could make those pontoons it was on. Um, and it turned out it was a complete disaster. The water wasn't clear enough to ever use this. We flipped it upside down the first time, which is why it's a quad moran at the end and not a, a catamaran. Um, and all it ended up getting used for was uh, for people to be able to tie their dogs up on the beach when they wanted to go for a swim. So the dog owners were happy, didn't help with my research, but, you know, I learned a lot of skills and, you know, a lot of times it's better to try, you know, nine crazy ideas. So that 10th one works rather than just do things that, you know, are going to work anyway. So, uh, you know, any, any uh, younger audience members don't get, get discouraged if things don't work the first time. Yeah, you know, keep keep trying new things to see what what works. Um, you know, so we talked a bit about you know some of these technologies we've used um, and the video technologies, and we put them on animals, but we've also been using these cameras to uh, different types of camera systems to ask another question, and that is how are reef sharks doing, um, and how important are reef sharks to the health of coral reefs. Um, and so we've been working on a project called the Global Fin Print Project, which is a collaboration of like about 150 scientists, NGOs, governments around the world, where we've gone to more than 400 coral reefs and put out uh, at each reef 50 cameras, let them record for an hour, an hour and a half, put bait out there and basically see how many sharks are there. So uh, I think we're up to like more than 20,000 hours of uh, camera uh, data collected from around the world. And we get images that look like this from some reefs. So uh, this is in French Polynesia, which is a shark sanctuary. So people are not allowed to catch, keep, or kill sharks uh, within an area about this part, you know, the size of continental Western Europe. So huge area. And this is what we see on the coral reefs uh, when we put cameras there. And we can compare that to areas around the world, um, including here in Florida. And we count not just the sharks, but the fish that are there. And then we can measure the health of the reefs. And um, what we've seen on this project is that as we lose sharks, um, we go from having a lot of sharks in the Caribbean. And as you lose sharks, you tend to see a lot more eels. So you're kind of replacing sharks with eels. Um, when you look globally, what happens is we lose the reef sharks. We start to see more rays 
and less sharks. And then as there's even more fishing, we lose the rays as well. So it does look like these uh, sharks are probably playing an important role on reefs. And we wanna have healthy reefs with plenty of sharks on them. Um, one kind of thing that we found as well that was a little bit worrisome is that on 20% of the reefs we looked at worldwide, we basically saw no sharks at all. So they're kind of functionally extinct, which means they're not serving the roles on those reefs that they used to. And it was about half of reefs where sharks were pretty well pleated. And even the really common species, you know, like the uh, gray reef sharks and black tip reef sharks in the Pacific probably qualify to be endangered globally because their populations have declined so much. But there is some uh, cause for hope. And that's that we found some reefs, even in areas with lots of people where we have healthy shark populations. So if it turns out, if you can get rid of long lines and gill nets, even if there's still fishing in other ways, shark populations uh, do pretty well. And also if you have areas where the fishing community actually has a lot of voice and uh, local communities uh, have kind of a role in local government, those tend to be areas where sharks and other animals can do well, even in the presence of fairly high amounts of fishing. So we're now working uh, with our collaborators and, and trying to follow up on this to make sure that we can uh, help rebuild shark populations where we need to, um, but then uh, make sure that uh, we have healthy systems that provide people with the resources they need uh, for years to come. So just kind of to, to end up on, on two little things here, people all often ask me, how the heck did I get into this? And uh, I did not grow up on the ocean. I grew up in uh, the middle of Ohio, uh, but spent a lot of time getting dirty, um, exploring everywhere I could, uh, probably at a, a center quite like the South Florida Wildlife Center. I ended up with a kestrel on my head. If anyone wants to guess how this ended up and you're chuckling, you are correct. It required a hose before I was allowed back in the house. But, you know, this is how I got excited. And, and one of the things that I'm really interested in is like, how do we inspire people, uh, whether it's kids or just the general public to, to really want to get involved and, you know, help restore uh, our environments that are so important to us. And, and these experiences were ones that were really important for me. But so were the people that I saw on TV, whether it was uh, Eugenie Clark or David Attenborough, um, you know, that really inspired me. So, you know, I do the TV documentaries because I hope that that helps inspire the next generation. And at FIU, we've got another thing that uh, we're really excited about that's helping us share the excitement of marine science uh, with uh, kids in the public all over the world. And that's Aquarius Reef Base. Um, this is an underwater habitat that uh, sits in about 60 feet of water, about five miles offshore of Isla Morada. And it's been in this location continuously since 1992. Um, and uh, Aquarius is about the size of a school bus and it lets you live underwater. So uh, have a look. We can live underwater, work underwater, and basically become part of the coral reef. By being able to link up live with kids in classrooms all over the world, we can bring them here to the coral reef and they can see what it's like to live here and inspire them in a way that you just can't otherwise. Here is Nikki. She's doing some work. And so you see pretty cool where we can actually live chat and, I, and the Wi-Fi I think is better from Aquarius than it is uh, at my house. Um, but, you know, it really lets us inspire people. And, and for scientists, the great thing about Aquarius is that uh, because we're saturated at depth, we can spend nine hours scuba diving a day instead of the maybe two, if you're lucky, depending how deep it is, if you have to dive from the surface. Now, when you're done in Aquarius, you do have to uh, slowly decompress it takes about 17 hours but hey we've got good internet so you can catch up on whatever streaming shows you need to um and you know since FIU took over operations in 2014 we've, we've probably reached about a million kids around the world uh with some of the chats and other uh events we've done and you know now we're excited about thinking about building the next generation of habitats out there where we can uh you know maybe even have an underwater broadcasting studio to really uh, let people know all the amazing things that are going on and how important our oceans are 
uh, for people uh, generally. So, you know, we're always excited about exploring and having that next adventure, uh, but that adventure that helps us make sure that we're leaving the world uh, a better place uh, for for future generations. And yeah, you know, kind of with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for, for dropping in and uh, would be more than happy to answer any questions you've got. That was awesome. Thank you so much. I love that you guys do virtual field trips from down there. Um, that's something that I'm sure the kids absolutely are obsessed with. <laughs> It, it, it's pretty amazing. You know, you take that iPad and they don't know where you are. And some are like, you ask where you think they are. You say, it looks like the space station and everyone's fine. And then you flip that around and show them the porthole and uh, they scream and fall out of their chairs. Um, <laughs> and it'll be even more amazing because what you saw in those renderings, those weren't cutaways, but we're actually going to hopefully be able to build it out of uh, acrylic Yeah. Um, or have big pieces because it's very strong and uh, you know, it'll really feel like you're part of the reef. That's really cool. So if anyone that is watching live with us has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll give you guys a couple minutes um, to get any questions that you have in there. I did have a question when you were talking about how you guys noticed when there were less sharks on the reef, eels would kind of take over. How did that affect the reef as a whole? Well, that's kind of the next step we're looking at is oh, okay. trying to integrate that reef health piece, because what happens is you get lots of those eels. And, and as you get just a little bit more human pressure, what happens is you have dead, you know, coral that's not in as good a shape, but you also lose the eels too. It's kind of the same with the rays. It's like, you can get to that point where there's just too much fishing for much of anything other than really small fish to be around. And, and that is one of the big questions we're trying to answer is, how important is it, you know, do, do healthy reefs need sharks or do sharks need healthy reefs? It's probably a bit, a bit of both, but, you know, as we, we shift from just protecting what's left to restoring populations and reefs, we need to know the mechanisms and how it works so we can get it right. Awesome. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions in the chat yet, but I'll go ahead and ask on behalf of everyone that's here and anyone that might watch this in the replay, what are some things that all of us can do to help protect our oceans and the reefs and the sharks and all of the wildlife that's out there? Well, it's it's a really good question. I mean, one of the biggest things you can do is just partially to the choices we make. Um, and you've got great resources out there like the Seafood Watch by Monterey Bay and, and others where you can select sustainably caught seafoods. Um, you know, you can also, there's, Honestly, it's the political pressure talking to our elected officials about, you know, what we need to do as a community because, you know, individual decisions are really important, but when it's collective action or we, you know, put big policies in place that can have a lot, a lot bigger influence. And, you know, as we see you know, climate change issues become more critical all the time you know, as corals are getting stressed by heat events. You know, we got to be doing those things that we can do to reduce our impacts on oceans, reducing our use of plastics, you know, using less energy if we can. And, you know, recycle is great. But as much as we have, we can reduce and reuse, those are actually more impactful and, you know, make sure that we're we're using the landscaping approaches that don't have runoff into the local systems. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are are working on that now. Um now I'm seeing some so, questions coming in too. Yeah, that was perfect. We talk yeah. about that a lot when we do educational programs too. So any little thing that anyone can do to help not only helps our environment here on land, but also out in the ocean too. Um, so you can, I know you can see the chat. Do you want to go ahead and hit those questions? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a uh, question here about, you know, need for volunteers and data collection. Um, stand by because we're about to do our second round of FinPrint. We may need people who would like to watch videos to help for, for us. Um, in the last round, I think I had to, I enrolled my mom who watched 3000 of those 20,000 videos for us to, uh, help get through. Cause we have to watch every video twice to make sure that everything matches up and then have people go in when they're in disagreement. So, um, you know, we, we may put it out and I mean, this is great to have South Florida wildlife center here that maybe we can put something out through the listserv if there are opportunities for people to get involved. So, so stand by, um, you know, we also have, uh, beach cleanups and things that we do through FIU that we often ask for people to get involved. 
Um, and then uh, another question about coral bleaching at the rate we're seeing here in South Florida. Um, yeah, the bleaching, it it's it can be patchy around the world. So there have been times when like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia has been, you know, really nailed quite badly because temperature can cause it, but then nutrients flowing in as well. And so it, it really is a global problem. And, you know, how bad it is in any one location really kind of depends on what those conditions are now. But, you know, it's concerning the rate at which it's happening and kind of the size, you know, just the scale um, that this is occurring. And so, you know, a lot of people are now working on, you know, even thinking about like, how do we help corals be more resistant or resilient to, uh, to bleaching or some of these environmental stressors? So um, it, it's an area with... Uh, not as many answers as we'd like to have right now. Um, and then there was another question from um, one of my coworkers who's watching live and she texted me over this question and she wanted to know if you had a favorite reef friendly sunblock that you use since you're out on the water all the time. Uh, I <laughs> pretty much get whatever is reef friendly at the local location. so I don't really have a go-to. <laughs> But but always but always make sure I do. Perfect. Um, okay, awesome. So I'm not seeing any other questions in here. Thank you, go, thank you, Dr. Hyatt, so much for taking time out of your day and speaking with us. And for all of you that did attend live and anyone that's watching the replay, for those of you that are here, I will be uploading this recording to our YouTube channel. Um, so you're welcome to re-watch this as many times as you want to watch those turtle videos again and all the cool shark content that we got to see, as well as share these with your friends and family so they can learn a little bit more about all the amazing work that's being done out in our oceans. Um, so thank you guys again and uh, for we do our wild lecture series once a month so if you guys are interested in tuning into more presentations feel free to follow us on social media so you can keep up to date with all of our events that we have coming up do you have a social media you want to share for FIU or yourself or anything yeah so I mean uh, at FIU environment is an easy one to uh, remember or yeah Mike dot or Mike height house really challenging one as well but um the FIU uh, environment one's a great one because you get lots of uh, information on what's going on uh, locally, um, especially in Biscayne Bay and the Everglades. So amazing faculty and students doing great stuff every day. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much. And I hope you have an awesome rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.